And um, we're absolutely delighted to welcome uh, Dr. Patricia Scanlon, who is the uh, Ireland's first uh, artificial intelligence ambassador, appointed by the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Employment in 2022. She was formerly the founder and executive chair of Soapbox Labs, uh, which is a company that uh, manufactures proprietary voice recognition technology for children. And she has worked for uh, 20 years in the field of artificial intelligence technology, including notably with Bell Labs and with IBM. So um, the way we're gonna do the event tonight is Patricia's going to give an address for roughly about 15 minutes uh, on the subject of artificial intelligence and then we'll go to discussion and Q&A with the audience. So it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, Patricia and hand over to you for 15 minutes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great, thank you, and thanks for coming out. It's freezing. Uh, hope you're all warmed up after a, a drink before we start. But um, look, it's very good to come out and talk to you guys. Um, I appreciate this, and I appreciate that it's really important, as many people as possible, really get to grapple with the idea of artificial intelligence. It's gonna be so pervasive in our lives, it's not going anywhere, it's just gonna become more influential. So the more people who understand it, and I understand from our, there are a lot of this around policy making as well, and it's really important for the people making policy to understand as much as they can about the technology. Um, what we don't want to happen is we have another crypto situation where people don't really understand the technology that's exploding, and, and AI has the potential to be a little like that because there's such depth and nuance to it. Um, the thing about AI is, and, and you know, there were, even up till about six, 12 months ago, a lot of people thinking it was a bit of a fad, it was just going to be a productivity tool, you won't notice it anymore, it would just fade into the background, we'll all get on with our lives, and I think, you know, other people likened it to the iPhone moment, or, or you know, that idea when the internet went mobile, um, others likened it to the internet, um, and I think that's where you're kind of getting to the... Um, the gravitas of what AI is. AI is arguably the fourth industrial revolution, um, building on previous um, industrial revolutions over the last uh, couple of decades and, and centuries. It's so, it, it's so transformative because we've only, it's the tip of the iceberg where we're at at the moment. Um, it's technology that's been in development for decades. I mean, arguably the theory back to the 50s and 60s, if not before, depends who you talk to. Um, first implementations were in the 80s, like real implementations in the 80s and around that time. Papers have been written about it. It's been building on for decades and decades. And the reason why we're talking about it today is because about 10 years ago, um, we start, first started dealing with uh, GPUs. We first had, first of all, we had cloud, we had good internet connectivity. Then we cloud computing at our fingertips on demand. That was absolutely transformative because prior to that, you used to have to have clusters of servers and that was to purvey of very big technology companies or universities that invested deeply. Suddenly you had cloud computing we could all get access to, that's kind of compute power. Um, but it was the GPUs. <coughs> so you might, CPUs are the, the, the processing units within computers and GPUs were actually the gaming processing units that actually allowed very large matrix multiplications to be done. Um, and that allowed huge amounts of data to be crunched. Prior to that, when I started my PhD back in 2000, um, you know, we didn't have the ability to crunch data like that. Uh, we just flat out wouldn't have worked. Um, so now with the advent of GPUs, with the advent of fast connectivity, data flow, access to GPUs, access to CPUs, access to all this power. Suddenly the theory from the 80s came to play in, in neural networks and then deep neural networks. And what you saw then the last 10 years, it actually was getting it right most of the time. And that's a big thing. If you think back to speech recognition, it was just frustrating. Um, you know, people, Microsoft had it since the 80s and 90s, but it didn't work very well, so nobody used it because it, was, it made more errors. And then gradually over time, it's suddenly making actually very few errors now, to the point where it's doing excellent transcription, kind of surprising transcription. Um, and that's the power of deep neural networks and the power of the technology we have today versus what we had even eight, 10 years ago. Then you have the advent of um, the LLMs, right, and the generative AI, but it's important to kind of distinguish them. So the expert systems are what we call things like speech recognition, um, your Netflix recommender, uh, your predictive text, 
on your image recognition. They're expert systems. They're trained on expert data and they do a very specific task. You can't ask a speech recognition system to suddenly start doing image recognition. It won't do it, it hasn't been trained that way. It's been expert, but sometimes expert systems have been called narrow AI versus strong AI or weak AI versus strong AI. It's a really poor description because what expert systems or narrow AI do is really, really narrow amount of stuff, but it does it so deep it can do better than humans. I mean, that's really important if you think about it. It can actually crunch data in more dimensions than humans can. It can actually do longitudinal data that our brains just can't possibly comprehend. It can pick out nuances in data that our brains would never see. So people, when they say weak AI or narrow AI, it really isn't very descriptive, but that's the AI we were talking about up until December, January last year. Then, actually it was probably September last year, then it started being the generative AI, right? And that's where we saw the, the image stuff, right? That was the first kind of thing that kind of really came to people's minds. Uh, the Pope in the puffer coat. I think a lot of people remember that one, right? And that was really like, like literally I've been in this space for years and I'm like, what, what? <laughs> but on the heels of that, about two, three months later, it became uh, ChatGPT. At first it was GPT-3, uh, which was, it was okay. It was getting a lot of stuff wrong and people were laughing about the hallucinations. And literally three months later, GPT-4, bang, it was absolutely amazing. And that generative AI is something, it's really important to realize, I've been in the space actually nearly 25 years now, um, but we, we had the concept of generative AI, right? We knew it was possible, but most of us thought that was 10 years, 20 years in the future. It took everybody by surprise, including the founders of OpenAI, including the godfathers of AI. Everybody in the space, all of us in the space for decades were blown away by how good it was. And the thing to note about the GPTs, the, the, the type of uh, models that were sitting behind ChatGPT, they're like a couple of hundred lines of code. It was actually the data, the ability to scrape the internet and the ability to crunch the numbers. Nobody really knew what was going to happen. And one of the challenges around policy and regulation is that actually... The people who do it don't really know how a lot of it works, it just does. Um, it's a little, it's a, quite a lot of a black box issue. So that's generative AI, right? It's creating something new uh, from underlying data that's been trained in the models. Now those models themselves, those GPT models or equivalent, are called foundation models or frontier models. And you hear a lot of the conversation has now shifted from um, generative AI to you hearing the frontier models and the foundation models. The UK uh, Safety Summit was a lot about frontier models. They are the models that sit behind the GPT, uh, ChatGPT. You can actually pay for ChatGPT or you can actually pay for a license for the GPT models. You could then take the GPT model and fine tune it and now it becomes something very bespoke to you and your data and your knowledge that you tuned it to, a little bit more like the expert systems that are still in existence and very powerful. You kind of almost get back there, but they can still do other things, right? So there are like three different kind of things, concepts in AI you, everybody needs to understand because they're very different to AGI, which is artificial general intelligence. That's the scary one, right? That's the one where the AI is more intelligent than us. It, it, it learns itself, it can strategize, it can do, it can just take that intelligence and start expanding beyond what it's been told to do. Um, the idea behind that is we need to put in guardrails, we need it to align with human values and, and you know, there's a lot of controversy about what a human value is. But the key to the AGI is it hasn't been invented yet, right? There's a lot of controversy about this. Um, a lot of people, I'm including myself really, I don't think the GPT models are going to be capable of it. But the problem is a little bit, and the reason why everybody is jumping up and down trying to get attention about this is because we didn't think the GPT models were going to be able to do as much as they did. So now it's kind of put everything up in the air about what's possible, right? And that's kind of key to where the fears and, and the anticipation and the caution that we're urging, right? But also the fact that it's separate, it hasn't been invented yet. But so it's actually, you know, if you want to look for a silver lining for a lot of fear, fear that's out there is, well, we actually have been become aware, the chat GPTs and the stability AI and all those ones have allowed us to become aware of what's possible and possibly a lot sooner than we thought. 
And that's a good thing, right? Because that's where we can actually regulate. So the EU AI Act last year didn't have the terms generative AI or foundation or frontier models in it. That literally up until kind of Q1 this year, they did that terminology wasn't even in the EU AI Act. And that's now all changed. And we've had time to do that because of it. So in some ways, there's a lot of good and bad and challenges and, and opportunities here. But to be able to actually address what's coming down the line at us and, be, and a bit of a wake up call to us all that going, this is extremely powerful technology. It's going to change society and economies as we know it. Um, and it's we have the time, we have the knowledge now about what's possible, what may come a little quicker than we think. But it's really important to kind of distinguish all those different types of AI, because a lot of times in the media, they're conflated. When they're conflated, it's confused, and that creates a lot of fear. So we have very real risks with the AI that's right in front of us now, the expert systems and the generative AI and the foundation models. That kind of um, AI will pose risks around bias. It will pose risks around IP ownership and infringement, copyright. You know, the New York Times are taking OpenAI to court as we speak because of some of the reproductions going to affect their business model. It's going to be really interesting how that plays out because that's going to speak to a lot about how these models are built on other people's data. <laughs> who owns the IP that's generated there? Is it the person who types the prompt? Is it the person whose data fed the models? Is it the person who owns the model? Who owns the output? And that's really unclear at the moment. So there's a lot of concerns around bias. It's really important to realize that bias is not just about a few outliers. You're talking about bias affecting very large percentage of the population. Um, and everybody, you know, there are people that go and say, oh, but we can't stifle innovation. You know, we can't, we have to be really careful. But it's really important to realize that after the UK Safety Summit, after the Biden administration's uh, guidelines and then executive orders and the EU AI Act, we're all broadly in agreement about what needs to happen now. I mean, in the US, because I think a lot of people say, oh, the EU are killing off innovation in favor because of the EU AI Act. But if you actually look at Biden's executive order, it's very long, it's about 70, 80 pages, it actually includes a lot around the federal government about what they're allowed to do. And it actually goes a little further in some ways than the EU AI Act and less than others. But broadly, they're trying to achieve the same thing. Um, and it will be up to Congress to legislate, to actually legislate for private companies. But it's almost as if the framework is there now. And there's not a lot of disagreement. The major disagreement we're seeing now is about how or should we regulate the frontier and the foundation models? How does that affect open source? How should we regulate? Who regulates? How do we regulate? To what extent do you regulate? And we're not the only ones in the EU grappling with this. This is a global issue. And I think some people would have you think the EU have gone too far in it. We're just further progress because it started earlier. So I think there's, that's about 15 minutes and that's actually a lot in that already. Um, but I'm very happy to take questions. And I just want to say before we start with any questions, um, it's really important. And I think sometimes that we all start understanding AI. And sometimes when a conversation has gone on for a year or longer, sometimes people don't want to ask questions because they feel like they should know by this stage what that means. Um, and I realize I want to say, is, look, no stupid questions here. Everybody's learning when you ask a question. Um, and it is really helpful for us all to get on the same page, particularly a lot of the work that you guys are doing now or will be doing in the future, that everybody understands AI. So please fire away. I, I'm very open to answering any questions, and I'll say if I can't. Thank you so much for Thank you. <clears throat> are you happy to stand from the podium? Or I'll sit down. Yeah. Yep. OK, very good. Um, maybe just uh, one from myself before we, before we kick it off. Um, you, you talked a little bit there about the problem, I suppose, of obviously the issues around regulating uh, AI and the different types of AI. But, you know, there is a broader issue around digital technologies generally, I think, that, you know, and we saw it with social media and the Digital Markets Act and the Digital Services Act, that quite often a lot of the technological advances are very far ahead before, uh, you know, regulation has the time to react uh, I mean, I wonder, do you have any views on, on how we can improve that and the importance of that, particularly for AI, given how quickly the technologies are evolving? Yeah, I think the idea behind all the regulation is, is quite simple in some ways, that if you try and, if the first, in the first instance, we're regulating the use cases, right? Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter 
in some ways, we've had a lot of different approaches to AI that got gradually better and improvements over time. But the principle's still the same. You know, you have to, you know, check for bias, you have to check for safety, you have to check for be transparent, you have to be explainable. These will, these will persist regardless of how good the technology gets or how it's implemented. You know what I mean? It's more about um, keeping humans at the center. You know, keeping, you know, where if it affects, if the, the decision of the AI is going to affect somebody's life uh, in their employment, in their finance, in their health, in their safety, you know, that will always be the same. Like, you know, actually, arguably, we should be, you know, there's going to be a lot of controls around um, employment, right? We actually don't have an, a huge amount of regulation about the training a human goes through, anti-bias training. Mm -hmm. You know, so arguably, maybe we should have done that, like, you know, but we're going to do it with AI, but arguably, if, if a human's making a decision, they should have some training too, de-biasing and stuff. So, you know, in the field of health and medicine and finance, there's a huge amount of regulation already. Mm -hmm. So this is just going to be more regulation. There's not a lot of the high risk use cases that are going to be more regulated and have to go through compliance and stuff like that, mm. they're actually in fields that are already quite heavily regulated anyway. So I don't see, I think if you keep the regulation focused at the outcome, the safety, then the technological advances won't change that much. Because what, what they're actually trying to do is replicate humans or do better than humans, but they're not trying to do something different. You know. Yeah, and I suppose, and obviously what you're saying about human-centered and and biases, obviously you've, you've a lot of experience in your company uh, with, and I was reading a good bit about your company before uh, the event around voice recognition technology, particularly for children in schools. And I suppose obviously it can be very dystopian, a lot of the discussion on AI, but obviously that's a very positive example mm. of changing people's lives uh, in using AI. Yeah, so our company is sought to develop speech recognition technology for children to be able to do assessment around reading and language learning, and we've done it from kids age, like basically two, three plus, once a human can understand them, not just the parent, um, you know, we can do the recognition, and basically it's been helping kids learn to read, print sounds, do automated assessments, but a big focus of the company was on the data privacy, but also on the equity side of it. So when I founded the company back in 2013, I was in New York at the time, and the idea, you know, I had their friend had a kid in the school, um, there and I remember thinking like there was like it's only about like thirty percent New York accents. There was accents from Britain, India, Ireland, Canada, you know, Mexico, California, and the accents were all so different. I remember thinking, well, if we're going to do this, there's zero point doing it if we wanted to be brought into schools if it doesn't work for everybody equally, mm. because you know, teachers will cop on, parents will cop on, kids will get frustrated and demotivated, or they'll just get bad, bad education if we don't do that right. So we focused very early on trying to figure out how do you collect the most diverse data? How do you make sure that the data that goes into the models um, will work for everybody, all accents and dialects, socioeconomic backgrounds? Yeah. And most people honestly didn't believe that was possible to do that. Um, and it is if you do it with a thoughtful intent, you can do it. And one of the reasons I took the AI ambassador role is because you know, the, the strategy of the government is for ethical AI. Um, and the EU, um, and we had actually built a company that does ethical AI and built a commercial successful company. So it was actually, I felt it was a good opportunity to take in a, a real world example of a company who has done it, has done well, yeah. um, to help make the point, because some people really do believe that they are exclusive, you know, you can't possibly be an ethical AI company and be profitable. You know. mm. uh, it's interesting, I was listening to um, The Economist uh, they have a new podcast called Boss Class, actually, it was very good. Um, but the co-founder of LinkedIn uh, is on it, and he's a big proponent of, um, of AI. And he was saying that it could actually get to the stage now where if companies aren't bringing in AI technologies as part of their processes, that they're risking actually lagging behind their competitors. And particularly, this would be the, the case in the, in the next number of years um, when AI becomes more mainstream, I suppose. Would you share that view? Or? Yeah, I mean, that's the problem. I mean, it's the opportunity and the problem, like, you know, is that there's a lot of people and out of fear, and this is why I think it's really important to understand the different types of AI and what's risky and what's not, because I've sat, I've been talking to a lot of boards and stuff like that where people are just like, oh yeah, it's way too risky. We're not gonna do anything. Like, and you're like, ah, right, <laughs> not the right approach. Um, yeah, if you're not doing it, that's fine. Your competitors will, and you will lose out because they'll be more innovative. They'll, you know, 
they'll reduce their prices because they'll find efficiencies. They'll, you know, they will be, if you don't, you don't have to, but be very aware that either somebody else who is using AI could innovate quicker than you, could eat your lunch. You thought you had a, a lead in the market, you could lose that lead. Um, and, and arguably, you know, create, you know, we rarely just compete with people in Ireland. You know, we can be globally, like, you know, and products being brought in, if you're selling globally, you're, you're competing in a global market. You know, people will be selling into Ireland. They're on the internet. There is no, that yeah. it's, it's so borderless when it comes to digital technology. Um, yeah, you have to. And you just be very keenly aware, and I think every board in the country should be requiring um, their executives there to, to be aware of what's going on and be able to answer to what AI could or couldn't do or what a competitor could or couldn't do with AI. Yeah, no, absolutely. And one of our uh, board members who shall remain nameless uh, was actually chatting to me about this uh, and he was telling us we should be paying more attention to ChatGPT because obviously as a research institute, yeah. uh, we're producing content that potentially could be produced by AI. So maybe I'll be out of a job in yeah. a few years now. <laughs> or uh, you'll just get better. It's, do you know what I like to think about this? It's almost like you're just moving the starting line. Right? Mm. So the starting line was here. Um, you're doing great work. No matter what it is, whether it's research or some kind of innovation, the starting line has just moved. You can choose to stay where you are, right? But things, you know, you could use the ChatGPT in that to help start your research, or you're, you're now starting it here. You still have to do the work. Mm. I don't think anybody should believe everything comes out of it or should just use it. I think it's, you know, but you know, it can help prompt and give ideas or find stuff that might have taken days of research or something like that, you know, the way, um, but with caution, <laughs> you yeah, know, because yeah. of the hallucinations and the problems with it as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so questions, uh, comments, let me throw it out. So I see Paula's hand first, uh, so we'll go to Paula. Thanks. Maybe to park the risk idea for a second, what do you think Ireland can be doing at a policy level and specifically wearing like an Ireland Inc type hat mm -hmm. to capitalise on the opportunities? Because as you've kind of covered, there's a lot of scaremongering out there and not a lot of talk about what we can do to really like seize yeah, the day. That's true. Good point. Um, I think one of the problems we have in Ireland is, and actually it's an EU problem, is that we're very good at funding university research in AI and all these different wonderful technologies. We're very good at FDI investment, you know, the investment in the and we're not very good at uh, investing in deep tech out of the university systems. We're very risk averse in our investment strategy. Um, the, it's an EU-wide problem. It's one of the reasons they came up with a rise in 2020 and the SMEI funding and EIC funding, they call it now. Um, to try and address that, where you, if you look at the funding that's gone into AI in the US versus the amount of funding that's gone into AI in Europe, you know, everybody goes, oh, why don't we have, um, you know, why couldn't we do an open AI problem? I'll give you a litany of reasons why we can't do it. I really think we need to address it. If we want to be serious about it, because we talk a lot about our university system, we talk about our education, we talk about our tech, but we don't talk enough about why we're not investing in our own indigenous um, and, you know, we have amazing research coming um, in our university. We fund it really, really well, but we don't, we're not successful at getting it out and getting it well funded. And we are leagues behind the US because of that. Um, you know, France has been trying to deal with that with Minstrel AI. Um, they got 100 million funding after being, you know, going for three months or something like that. But it was their equivalent to try to get their, a French equivalent of open AI. So they are like throwing money at it. So there are some, countries that are sitting up going, yeah, we need to be, you know, so I th sometimes we lament that Ireland doesn't have enough unicorns and I'm, I'm sitting here going, yeah, I can tell you why we don't um, have those companies. I suppose one thing we're interested in here as well uh, about is uh, digital skills and equipping our graduates with the, with the correct um, digital skills for not just the private sector, but obviously policymakers in the, in the public sector as well. Where do you think we are in terms of how we're doing um, in the education system in terms of equipping our, our, um, our students and our graduates with the necessary digital skills, particularly for AI? I mean, there's a lot of work going into it. Um, it's not happening quick enough, you know, and it never does, like, obviously, when you're trying to change this. There's a great course in Limerick called the Immersive Software Engineering um, course now. That's, it's it's a more equivalent to one of the Canadian universities um, where they actually do, it's a very condensed master's, but it's all about practical, very little sitting in the class 
looking at the, you know, the whiteboard kind of thing, mm. um, and doing internships every year. Waterloo, I think, is the university in, in Canada that's you know, really well known for producing um, excellent kind of students and interns and stuff like that. So it's kind of more in that model, mm. really innovative. Um, I really like what they're do those guys are doing there. I really think one of the opportunities we could do is to start doing an AI 101 in every course. You know, in most courses, like giving people the opportunity, no matter what course they're doing, is to take a very, I think if everybody had a basic understanding of AI, it would help because it's going to influence every industry um, and, and most jobs as well. So people understand that at some level would be very helpful. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Any more questions? Mark, over to you. I maybe might just identify your uh, name and affiliation as well. I should have said at the beginning. Paula is NTMA. Hi, thanks so much for the um, very insightful talk. My name is Mark. I'm a lecturer at the Institute of Public Administration. Um, so my question relates to education as well. Um, putting aside the, the, obviously there's a lot of kind of ethical debates about the use of AI in research and where that can exist or shouldn't exist. In instances of, say, where material is generated by AI, uh, AI but effectively used for plagiarism, um, I'm curious about, there's a lot of detection technologies that exist now. And I'm, I suppose, interested firstly in your, how these kind of technologies work, but also your assessment of are they kind of up to scratch at the moment? Because I'm thinking beyond just education in terms of there's a lot of discourse about, you know, falsified political information mm. and things and being able to detect what is AI and what isn't. Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot of talk about detect detection technology. I, I understand there's a lot of problems with it. Um, I think there was some students with English as a second language being flagged as, you know, generated by ChatGPT and the like, which is a problem. Like so, um, it's one of those things that the pace of innovation, technology, and, and the counter technology kind of lags. I think it should be a policy, a government policy in every country to fund the counter technologies because I don't think they're going to be as profitable as the technologies themselves. Therefore, they're less likely to get investment and things. So I think that should be for a social, you know, social good that we, that we look to these things because, um, yeah, they won't make as much, but they need to be there and they need to keep pace. I heard this great thing, but there was um, some artists before they now upload their te their uh, art onto the internet, they can actually use some kind of skin. But what it does is really messes with those scrapers. Um, to the point where it actually totally messed up that the, the thing couldn't create a good picture of a dog. Like the dog was all like distorted and stuff because people started doing it. So I think that's a good example of a counter technology. Um, you know, so and, and a lot of the university systems I think will probably end up doing a lot of that research. Um, I don't know of any that's up, completely up to scratch for plagiarism right now um, because it isn't actually plagiarism, if you think about it, for the most part. I know the New York Times have got really good examples of where it was actually just completely lifted from the, the articles. But the idea of generative AI is it's creating something new. So what you're actually, but I could say to it, um, you know, write this a paragraph basically in the style of this or write it in a more formal way, write it in a more casual way. So that's getting hard because, so you can actually, go to town on your description of how it should articulate it. Therefore, I, I'm finding it hard to understand how you would have a technology that would robustly tell you it was made by AI because of the infinite number of ways the, the AI can generate it. In, yeah, I think, I think we're going to have to be a little bit more inventive about how to assess progress. And be like, it's almost like the calculator in some way. It's here now. All right, it's not going away. So should we have things like, um, you know, for a PhD or for a Viva, you gotta stand up for your defense and you have to speak and you have to answer questions on the fly. Like maybe we move to that model, you know. Maybe we do something that, you know, I, I think there are other technologies that lock down the screen so somebody can't possibly do it and they can't copy paste. Maybe you could use your phone but you're not gonna be able to type, you know, do it. So th there are, I know that somebody, people working on technologies around, you know, being able to tell if you're using another device in the room and all that. In some ways, I think they're very short-term solutions. I think we need the longer-term solutions to, God forbid, reinvent the education system, you know? <laughs> I mean, that's not an easy task, like, but it's been, in some people's opinions, long overdue, that how we, we do it. We now recognize this exists. It's in our lives. It's not going away. Therefore, how do we educate and how do we assess, basically? Very good. Uh, this gentleman here. Hi, thank you. 
Uh, actually, it's a comment. Uh, thank you for your interesting talk. And uh, my comment is about the education, the aspect of education and the in uh, importance of why we should teach AI. I uh, just wanted to make sure, I mean, I am Nikhil. I am at uh, Dublin City University, a final year PhD candidate. Actually, this semester I'll be teaching at Trinity uh, two modules. One is technology and international politics, and the other is politics of AI. And it's coming from the same inspiration that you haven't introduced that it's very necessary for having more clarity on what AI does and the distinction between different types of AIs and regulatory aspects, mm -hmm. who does and why. Mm -hmm. so, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Very good. Um, Josh? Over there. Yep. Uh, so yeah, Josh with uh, Vulcan Consulting. Uh, so I was particularly interested in your observation that the EU and the US are more or less simpatico in terms of the thrust of AI regulation. Um, and I was just wondering whether you had any insights on like moves towards, I suppose, global harmonized rules on AI regulation and whether there's potentially any risk of the US and Europe putting themselves at a competitive disadvantage relative to its geopolitical competitors like China, particularly in terms of the application in military circumstances, for instance? Yeah, um, I think there's very specific exclusions in the UAI Act around military and, and, and law enforcement. They are always treated differently and they will be. Um, so I don't think the EU AI Act is going to necessarily, there's restrictions on using it for real time monitoring of biometric systems, uh, emotional detection, things like that. But there is always going to be exceptions and stuff that's done in military that we don't know about. Like, so there's a lot of work going on at the moment about the ethics of, of war. I actually heard a great um, talk about there was a weapon invented, and it was back in, you know, obviously the last century, but I think it was the latter half of it, where they were using lasers to blind the opponents, the, you know, very effectively blinding, uh, you know, combatants on the field. But both sides decided not to use it. Um, and it's really interesting kind of thing that, you know, there, people have this idea that China and Russia are just going to, you know, let's say economically anyway, just going to fire ahead and let loose and run whatever that. It hasn't yet been very politicized. You know, you're going to have a lot of people who haven't yet decided whether it's good or bad for them. If you were just to let AI run rife, I couldn't see China letting AI run rife. They're trying to control the population. They're not going to just let any AI run rife, like you know, because they or anybody else is not. It, we don't know what's going to happen if we do. The regulation there is to put guardrails on it. So that it benefits us and doesn't, you know, isn't detrimental. When it comes to war, I, you know, and and weapons, I will be of the mind that we don't know what the West is doing or not doing. Um, I don't think they're going to advertise what they are aren't researching on that, whether it's at a disadvantage or not. So you know, let's say you know, every other statistic on how much the US has spent on the military does not tell me that they're going to hold back on if it's going to give an advantage, we don't know. Um, but I think economically people have, I hear this over and over again, that we shouldn't regulate because China and Russia, because China and Russia, and I'm sitting there going, mm, I don't know about that. Like, I mean, one of the biggest fears of most governments is that it will destabilize economies and, and societies. Like, you create civil unrest, you know? That doesn't exactly behoove anybody in government. You know, and I think a lot of um, governments right now, if you think about it, it's become highly, the discussions around regulation and technology have become highly polarized. They haven't become politicized yet. You know, there isn't necessarily, you couldn't think, let's say, you know, imagine the US, um, Republicans or Democrats have fallen down on one side or the other. They haven't, it's right and left, because nobody's really sure if it's gonna help them or not, you know? Um, you know, and what it will do, so I think, it. I think at the moment, the main people you hear calling for no regulation are people in tech, uh, because you know it's expensive to 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 do compliance, and people would rather not. A lot of industries have never had any compliance before, so they'd rather not get into it. You know, I think the tide's moving now, and it's more or less accepted that most applications of AI will be um, regular. Only the high risk ones. Actually, a good thing to note is a lot of medium to low risk stuff, which is probably the majority of it will not be regulated. It's actually only the high-risk stuff that 
largely has already been regulated, will continue. The difference now is the regulation of these frontier and, and foundation models, and that's where a lot of lobbying and discussion and, you know, um, I think you heard of like France and Italy, and it wasn't Germany, I think um, a couple of the countries, including France anyway, push back very strongly on the idea of regulating the foundation model, largely because of minstrel AI and, and, and those types of companies that want to compete with the US. Mm. So, you know, that's all to play for still at the moment. But. Okay, very good. Um, I see Kira over here, and then I see the lady at the back as well. Hey, uh, Kira Campbell, thank you very much for being here. Um, following on from the example of GDPR, which was intended to be a world trendsetter and in many ways was, but did contribute to the fragmentation of the internet in that many websites who do not adhere to European data privacy either do not run in Europe or have different versions. Um, will the impact of differing AI regimes or governance contribute to a further fragmentation of the internet? Thank you. Yeah, very good question. Um, I think over time, I think in the beginning there was a lot of that GDPR thing. It seems to have resolved itself. I don't come across very many websites that don't allow you in now. They just have that annoying pop-up that you just have to agree to stuff or disagree. Um, one of the big differences with the AI models is they cost billions to run, like billions and billions. They are like, they're making a lot of money. They are not making as much money as it's costing. Um, you know, are they really going to not want to commercialize and sell in the EU at all? You know, so, and then the question for companies is like I was saying earlier, you know, the federal government, there's an executive order now that there is a lot of uh, red teaming and, and testing and compliance they have to do to be used for the federal government in the US, which is huge, right? It's a huge market for a lot of those tech companies. Um, and then arguably Congress could follow. Now, look, we'll see what happens in the next year. So the UK really have flagged a lot of this as well. I think it's all up there. So if you were a tech company betting on what's going to happen, are you going to bet that you're going to get total free reign and no regulation? Or are you going to start just investing in some of the guardrails that you likely will need in the future? Um, I think that's, for me, it seems unlikely the way the conversations have gone that there will be no regulation um, at all. And I think it's a very convenient argument for some people to say that the EU, the EU, the EU, and you know, you're going to lose business, you're going to stifle innovation, you're going to... I think the biggest challenge for the EU and anybody else who regulates is to invest and support and give the resources to the regulators. Because one of the biggest problems with the GDPR was, I mean, how many big cases actually came out of it? It was so slow, it was bit fumbling, there wasn't a huge amount of uh, enforcement of the regulation. So one of the biggest challenges would be finding the expertise to staff the regulation and the compliance and, and, and the, the monitoring of the situation. And that's going to be, without significant investment, it will be a problem. So I think it's all well and good to write the regulation, but if you don't support the um, the regulators and, and the implementation of it, that's where you're going to create bigger problems. I think, I think we're only halfway through the problems of, of, of this, and until I see how it's going to be um, regulated, you know, I'll reserve judgment on how good or bad it's going to be. But if we could do it really well. There's It's right there in front of us. It's just, I really hope we don't under-resource across the EU on this because, you know, you can really mess it up. Like, you have all the best intentions, but you can mess it up then. And then you're almost handing a reason over to the people who don't want to be regulated to not be regulated, right? Because they go, oh, see what happened, you know, and then they go, no, and they're going, oh, okay, why don't you just self-regulate? And then we're going to be, I mean, social media all over again. Like, we still haven't got any decent regulation. We know the harms it does. Like, And, and just from your own point of view, obviously, as a business person, um, and there obviously there may not have been much... Uh, regulation for AI when, when you were working with your company, but what is it that you're looking for uh, in terms of regulation? Would you prefer no regulation, or if there is regulation, what are the things you want to see if you're a business person? Uh, yeah, I'd like to, let, let's move quickly and, and help companies figure out what the regulation is going to be. Mm. Um, 
we, there was <coughs> regulation, but you know, it was kind of, to me, it was common sense. Back in 2013, it was like the Wild West when it came to data and AI. Um, but we were building technology for kids. I had have two kids. Um, I kind of felt, you know, how I, I would feel, number one, about the data privacy aspects, two, about the equity. So it was kind of, to be honest, it was common sense a little bit to me that if we were going to build a product that was going to be trusted, um, used by teachers, where we had to be, you know, be on the right side of the data issue, data privacy issue, be on the right side of the equity discussion as well, um, because it was part of our USP in the market, right? I mean, we're, we were competing with big tech, um, but we were the only company in the world who actually received certification in AI equity. And that was like front and center of our, our marketing and our advertising, and our clients loved to use our logo because that meant you were, you know, it was a credible piece of technology. It was really good for us in the market. And it, I kind of scratched my head going, well, why if you're building AI, and somebody, your client, because a lot of times when you're building AI, you're licensing to somebody else who integrates into their product, much like we did. Um, why would you not want it to work for everybody? <laughs> you know? Because, mm. you, know, you know, to be frank, a lot of the AI, particularly around speech recognition, was primarily working for US white males of a certain age, right? And that was based on the fact that they were the users of the internet predominantly in the US. So then when the internet, and everybody's using the internet eventually, and they were just happened to be the first uh, movers on it, um, they end up creating this problem where they actually, I think it was something like, it was creating 20 to 30% more errors for black speakers than white speakers. And that's all a big tech, right? They did this study in Stanford, um, and it was published by the New York Times. And I kind of go, well, this is a product, like, so when somebody brings out a product that works for everybody, everybody starts just naturally gravitating to the one that's less frustrating, that works better. To me, it's kind of almost like common sense. You, I understand we all want to rush products to market because, you know, competitive advantage. It's not always the first mover who wins. Like, mm. you know, if you, somebody brings out a better product, they, people eventually start gravitating towards that. Now, there is the VHS versus Betamax discussion where the better technology didn't win out. But when it comes to AI and it's making errors and it's causing scandals and, you know, it, it's, you're splashed all over the New York Times once again for, for, for messing up. But there's another company that actually did a little slower, but then maybe they just built it more thoughtfully and now it works for everybody, the better product. You know, I mean, the, you know, the more trust, if you're talking about in finance, if you're talking about in medicine, if you're talking mm. about in health, if you're talking about in education, if you're talking about in employment, you know, the one that makes all the errors and causes class action lawsuits or the one that, you know, has a reputation. And it'd be really good, and I have this idea that Ireland does have an opportunity to take the mantle of ethical AI if we invest in it, mm. you know, because... You know, again, rushing out the crappy product to market that works for I don't know, 70, 80 percent of the population is not really the best commercial decision. I just wonder about the logic of that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the lady at the back, and then we have another another uh, lady here as well. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Carmen. Uh, I am working as an IT compliance officer in our money. And my question is like regarding the topic that we talked about before, the innovation, how do you think we can include rural areas so they are not left behind? Include, sorry, what? Rural areas? Oh, yeah. Thank you. I think a lot of that is, uh, one of the issues around SMEs anyway is, you know, there's a, a, a strategy of the government to get 90% um, of SMEs to be digitized by 2030 and then 70% maybe using AI. Um, one of the biggest problems is the digitization. You gotta do that first, you know, and then, and then educate people. And I think one of the best ways to educate, you know, SMEs. And the nice thing about post-COVID is the decentralization of a lot of businesses that we don't all have to be located in Dublin anymore or, you know, building companies outside of Silicon Valley is actually, you know, very achievable now. Um, if you can, there's an opportunity for people to stay where they are to build commercial entities, provide employment in rural areas. You need the digitization, you need the connectivity, you need the broadband, and then you slowly start educating people on what, how AI can help them. And there's a whole education program. There's a lot of work going to be going on. There's these things called innovation hubs. Uh, they're funded across Europe. 
Um, CEDAR is one in Dublin. I think there's another one actually in Ireland. They're going to be funded to help SMEs when they want to. And the idea eventually is we should be giving grants to people or you know start helping them take the step into, first of all, digitizing, and second, introducing AI to improve their business to help them com compete in Ireland and compete globally. Um, because the problem is, you know, again, back to what we were saying earlier, if you don't look at AI, how it can help, somebody else will, and then you, you, know, you lose your business. So I think the rural, um, you know, I, I would look at it first from a, supporting the SMEs and the businesses in rural parts, but you've got to start first with digitization. Yeah. And a lot of it is not just helping them start out and, and get started, but also helping them scale up then. Uh, as well to become to become large companies. I mean, um, do you see that in the government's strategy that that is the the sufficient support is there for that, or could we be doing more there? I think there is actually. There's quite a lot. It's a lot better than it used to be. I think there's mm. you see these innovation hubs and things all over the country now, mm. um, and you don't have to be located in a city anymore. You can participate in accelerators and. You know, I think there's a lot of different types of business, and I think that's always. I think sometimes we always gravitate to where everybody needs to scale up. They don't. You know, mm. some people want to run a lifestyle business and employ a few people in a town and themselves. And you know, we need to support those people too, mm. um, because they can do very good business. They don't all need to scale either. Like you know, but when they do want to scale, there are accelerators. I think that whole idea of um, allowing people to participate when they're located in rural areas as well, and they don't have to be five days a week at the accelerator. I think that's really mm -hmm. good. Like, and I think they've definitely seen that happening now. So we can always do more. And I think a lot of that is, for me, very much is looking at how and who we invest in. Mm. Um, We're getting slightly off topic now, I think, with some of this stuff. But um, the, uh, the lady here had a question. And then I see Jake as well. Hi, uh, Lydia Dutling from Access Partnership. Firstly, thank you for uh, speaking with us today. Uh, I just wanted to pick up on the com competition uh, point raised earlier. Uh, I think the EU AI Act seeks not only to regulate uh, AI, but also tries to encourage um, competitive development in, in Europe by introducing um, like regulatory sandboxes and also exemptions for open source, mm. um, specifically on kind of open source and the development of these communities and collaboration. Do you think that's a viable solution for raising Ireland's and the EU's competitiveness against US big tech? Or do you think that providing exemptions for this specific category of AI developers could lead to more risks than benefits? <sighs> that's so hard. Um, you know, it's, it's a very open discussion right now. It's like, it's really current. And to be honest, when I listen to both sides, I see there's valid points. I'm not someone who just like, you know, I'm not gonna, I fall down on one side. I really believe in regulation. Um, but, you know, handing a market to the incumbents or the, you know, five big companies who can afford to run these models doesn't really make sense either. I think a lot's gonna change in the next two years. I think at the moment, the LLMs that are really effective need to be, it costs billions to run them. I don't think that's always going to be the way. I think you're going to be able to run those very effectively for a lot cheaper. And I think that's going to open the market and it's going to change a little because, um, you know, even the way the EU AI Act is written now, it's over a certain amount of flops and processing that the reg land, if you're less than that, and they put it that way because currently that's how it works. But back to your point earlier, technology moves really quickly. Therefore, suddenly you're going to have stuff that's probably as effective as the, the LLMs of today in about a year or two, running under that, that thing. So what are you going to do about that? You know? <laughs> so um, I think the open sourcing issue is interesting. I think the regulation will still be on the use cases. So you still will have to maintain uh, you know, evidence about bias. You know, so, one of the problems it's going to be is, again, coming back to the how it's regulated, right? What is the steps that somebody has to go through? Um, do you just have to show, using a certain amount of test data, that it doesn't have bias? Or do you have to have evidence from the underlying... Remember, I was talking about the foundation models? So let's say you're using an open source foundation model. Um, will you get an exemption then? because you're using an open source that you don't have to say anything about the data it was trained on, any of the IP is copyright, IP, IP issues behind it. Um, are you allowed to use it in finance 
if you used an open source model, but it's fairly closed, it's, it's a black box, but it's now used in finance. You know, that's where I, and I haven't heard quite yet the details of how that's going to, to, to Peter, right? I think that's going to be really important when it comes to open source. Are you getting complete exemption? So can you use it in surgery? If it was like an open source model and it's suddenly being used to do something about the, the outcome of somebody's life, like, you know, I, that's where I'm, I'm, I'm personally unclear about because these discussions are only ongoing right now about the open sourcing, about what's not going to be regulated. So therefore, in a very high risk use case, can you do that? Like, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, sitting here waiting <laughs> to hear myself about it. So I think there's a lot that still has to be understood about how the regulation is going to actually practically work. Um, and I think that's like, as we speak, ongoing. Okay, very good. I'll come to Jake and then I'll do last call for questions if that's okay. So if you have any questions, please put up your hand now and then I'll take them maybe with, uh, with Jake's as well. So if, if you're happy to take yeah, three. Yeah, yeah, great. very good. So we have Jake, Jack, and then we have Brian as well. So I'll take the three. Hi, uh, I'm Jake Tran from the Department of Children. Uh, just wondering, a lot of the conversation has kind of been about, you know, what the government can do in terms of sort of work, you know, helping other people uh, use AI or regulate AI for other people. But in terms of kind of policy making in AI itself, what do you think, uh, do you think governments in particular, our government, are kind of doing enough in terms of thinking about how they can use AI themselves in their own processes and putting kind of the necessary resources and skills into that? Yeah, well, I've... I've, I've maybe, maybe I'll just take yeah, Jack yeah. and um, Brian as well, if that's okay, just from the interest of time. Uh, yeah, yeah, Jack from the Department of Finance. My question should be a lot shorter than Jake's. Just wondering about, like, from your perspective as the AI ambassador to, for Ireland, where do you get your information from? Like, what's your engagement with the industry? Like, you're, you quoted from the New York Times considerably this evening, just for pure examples, just wondering where your reliable sources are coming from in this world of unreliability. With respect to what? With AI in general, like the way we, all the... Like the, the, you're saying, you're waiting for things to come out, and these conversations are ongoing and happening. Like you're not in the room, are you, or not? Or like those kind of instances. Like, like, where is the material coming from? Kind of, it's not just coming from the back of your mind. I can tell that, but it's just where is the information coming from, and where can others find it as well? Okay, very good. I might take Brian then as well, if that's okay. You have to remember much, these and, uh, yeah. Thanks for the discussion. Um, <laughs> I suppose my question is just more around we've. You discuss a lot around regulation, etc. But some great use cases coming out already, uh, like in terms of health uh, preventative measures, but also in terms of kind of health screening and bits like that. And I just wonder, like I know myself, and my family, my uh, grandmother really had a heart attack, but the Apple Watch was telling her, "Yeah, th this is coming up. You need to get your heart checked. And another two or three days, you know, you'll be in trouble." Wow. Um, but I suppose I'm just wondering, do you think that the conversation will move on from regulation to more? This is the this is the benefit. This is the societal movement in it um, and do you think there's more that needs to be done to kind of communicate better to older age groups who might not be that confident with a smartphone never mind to get an AI mm -hmm. thank you pretty good um, so regards to what the government is doing I've, I've been in a lot of uh, meetings about trustworthy AI in the public sector um, things like that so there is a lot going on um, could they do more yeah possibly I often get the question going is Ireland leading? Where are we? But it's all so new. Um, I don't think it's a case of you know any one country is leading. I think the US leads because by virtue of the amount of money they invest in it more than anything else. Um, but I've seen a lot of what the government are already looking to do. Uh, but there's a lot of concerns. There's concerns around data. There's concerns around the ethical nature of the uh, you know what. I think you know, you've got to be kind of careful as well about what you're going to use it for. Um, nobody wants to build the technology or you know, license technology and then fall foul of the upcoming EU AI Act. So I think there's a lot of kind of, a little bit of trepidation. But yeah, I, I found it interesting enough and, and people curious enough and there's enough um, investigation going on about what can happen. Um, I think the next year or two, Again, it's really new because prior to ChatGPT, a lot of the AI technology was a little bit, you know, it's a little more niche. Like, you know, now this is more something that can help across the board. But because a lot of these open AI, all these different kind of models, um, they're very black box, you know, there's a little bit of trepidation. Nobody's rushing into it. Um, and, and, you know, I think thoughtful implementation of AI is important. 
there's a lot at risk. Like you know, so I think, you know, I think we're almost over the data problem and and the, and the permissions and the data privacy and the respecting the, you know, we kind of need to move past that. Say okay, we have that sorted because there's a lot of work's gone on that already. Um, to then it's once everybody's happy with that, then but what can it, the data be used for? And then the question is, is the government building their own AI or are you going to license a third party? And licensing a third party is where it comes in, a whole host of problems comes in. Because you have to know, are they going to be transparent or are you talking about black box stuff again? Because a lot of them won't, don't want anything coming out. They'll tell you they're 99% accurate on what, like, you know, <laughs> what data. So I think there's a lot of challenges about the um, licensing and the testing and the red teaming you're going to be when you're using a third party. Because a lot of time a government's not going to build their own. They're going to license in. And you've got to be super careful about who you're licensing. Because, you you know, there's already examples of, of lawsuits and class action lawsuits going on in the US and where it was used in law enforcement. Uh, so we've got to be super careful about how we go forward in the EU with that. Okay. Um, I think the, uh, the other question... Oh, yeah. Sorry, oh yeah, sorry, Gentlemen. yeah was where I get my information from. Um, 25 years in the space, I'm an engineer, I'm technical, I read, I read research papers, I worked in the industry for years, I, I understand how it's, I'm involved in lots of meetings, I liaise with policy makers um, who are at the EU and who are at the table. Um, I get summaries and feedback and, you know, I say it's kind of my life, <laughs> so. Um, reading research papers, um, you know, a lot of the, the EU stuff, all those regulations are public, like, you know, whatever comes out in the new, there's nothing hard to find, you just have to be able to read it. I'd highly recommend anybody read, um, the Biden administration released, um, what do they call it? the blueprint for AI, very readable. Um, and it's one of the most commendable things I thought about it was while, you know, we did a great job in the EU of producing the EU AI Act, I just found it more readable for the general public to read the blueprint for, for AI. And it's pretty much, again, th there's going to be details that are not the same, like about how it's going. But broadly, if you want to understand what it, what it all means and what, even you'd be able to translate what the EU is trying to achieve by, I just find it very readable for um, people. But yeah, that's it. Well, uh, and I, the thing, sorry, the last one I'll oh just yeah. say. Sorry, it's on the but, medical stuff. Um, you know, there, there's been decades and decades of work on, on medical, so I think that's, that's near, separate to what's happened in the last year. Um, a lot of times you, what you'll notice is that will all just melt into the background. Do people really know, need to know it was AI or was it just a, a trigger? You know the way it was the, you know those, those fall detection things that people have? You know, the watch does it now. You know, it's kind of like, it's, it's like an almost, it's just an evolution. I think um, what you'll see now more and more is that AI will be integrated into more and more products and will make those things more usable probably more than anything else. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, the, 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 the thing about the health and the medical, that was happening anyway. I think just the world's woken up to AI because in the last year, but they're very different almost areas, you know. But I just want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, I want to thank everybody for your, your questions and your comments. Uh, but most importantly, I want to say a huge thank you to uh, Dr. Patricia Scanlon uh, for her time here this evening. And I know I've learned a huge amount uh, about AI that I didn't know previously, and I hope it'll benefit you uh, in your work and, and in your lives as well. So um, just in terms of our next event, you will all receive an invitation tomorrow uh, to the next event on the 25th of January with uh, Federica Mogherini. Um, who was High Representative of the European Union from 2014 to 2019. Uh, now she is the rector, or essentially the, the, the head of the College of Europe. Um, she's going to talk to us about, so we're going to do it in the Belgian residence, the ambassador's uh, residence on Aylesbury Road, and she's going to talk to us about um, the challenges for the European Union's uh, strategic agenda from 2024 to 2029, of which I'm sure AI and, and the whole digital space will will feature quite prominently. So hopefully we'll see you there. Keep an eye on your emails for the invitation. And thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.